Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 61, May 16th to May 22nd, 1862. Last week, we had the U.S. Navy being repulsed at Drury's Bluff and additional action on the Mississippi River. This week, we will continue to have the Army of the Potomac getting into position for the capture of Richmond. For the Confederacy, this situation looked bleak, but without knowing it, the action at Hanover Courthouse will be the high water mark for Little Mac's attempted capture of the rebel capital. And yes, this event will technically be next week, but it fits really well right here, so this is the week we're going to discuss it. Before I get into that discussion of Hanover Courthouse, though, I do want to just mention that hopefully by the time this episode comes out, there will be additional Patreon content, and we are going to do another movie review because it fits extremely well with the narrative, and it's going to be The Great Locomotive Chase, uh, and that is a Disney picture uh, starring Fess Parker, Fess Parker most notably of Davy Crockett fame there, so if that sounds like something that will interest you, that is hopefully going to be posted on the Patreon feed. The link to that is going to be in the description Next month is going to be June here, obviously, uh, and I do want to maybe go back to the tour of the battlefield uh, kind of deal that we did with Pea Ridge. One of the great things about being in the Richmond area, close to Richmond, is that you can go and see these things anytime you want. So something that probably most travelers to the city are probably not taking a look at. So I'm hoping to do another picture slideshow again for June so if you want to see that I'm going to try to couple it with the action that's going to be happening here for the seven days battle so if that sounds like something that interests you then uh, once again a link to the Patreon will be in the description and be on the lookout for that in June so let's take a closer look at the strategic situation following the collapse of the defensive line at Yorktown and the battles at Williamsburg and Eltham's Landing. So at the conclusion of all that action, the Confederates have fallen back closer to the city. McClellan has advanced his huge army to meet them. Obviously, this would take some time to complete. As we recall, the roads in the peninsula were not very sturdy, especially when having to face the large amount of men, animals, and war material that was now shuffling west. McClellan did have a problem as he set up his headquarters at a place called White House, which sat on the Pamunkey River. The Pamunkey flowed into the York River, but this was not his issue. The Chickahominy River flowed a little further south and would prove to be a barrier, dividing the Army of the Potomac north and south. Now, in the modern day, the Chickahominy is really nothing to look at. In fact, you hear these accounts and then look basically at a stream and you're sort of like, really, this is it? It's not very wide. It's certainly, it's no Potomac. It's no Mississippi River, that's for sure. But the thing about the Chickahominy is, there were times when the rains would swell the river and thus make it more of an obstacle. Obviously, this heavy rain would cause the river to flood, and the flood plain would make for particularly swampy conditions, which would be difficult for an army to pass. This will play a big role in our soon-to-come action at Seven Pines, However, we will put that to the side today. In addition, there were various stronger defensive positions along the Chickahominy 
that would make assault difficult. Little Mac thought that this would be soon solved, however, with the arrival of Irvin McDowell's corps from Fredericksburg. Now we know that McDowell is not coming, but McClellan was still going to operate under the assumption that eventually he would join him. In an effort to potentially link up with this southern movement from his reinforcements, McClellan would send Fitz John Porter out to the right, moving toward a place called Hanover Courthouse. When we say to the right here, we mean he is going to the north, so that is the direction he's going in. Porter could cut off any retreat from the Confederates to the north. Now we have mentioned Porter before, but we need to give him a proper introduction. Fitz John Porter's real crime was that he was a McClellan partisan, and was made an example of later in 1862. But don't you worry, we are certainly going to get there. The New Hampshire native was the cousin to David Dixon Porter, and had attended West Point before serving under Winfield Scott in Mexico. Porter would be on the staff of Robert Patterson in the Shenandoah Valley before shifting to command under McClellan. He will be with us for the Peninsula Campaign, the Seven Days, and also serve under Pope at Second Manassas. Pope is going to heap some blame on Porter, who will then be court-martialed, supposedly for insubordination. Although, if one was to analyze the Battle of Second Manassas, as we will be sure to do, it's really not that fair of an assumption to take of Porter. The court-martial would be filled with partisans of the Republican Party, who already would not like McClellan or those who were personally linked to him. They would also be those who owed Edwin Stanton, who at that time would be the Secretary of War. Fitzjohn is going to spend the next 16 years trying to clear his name, finally exonerated and placed on a bill in 1886, adding him back to the role of infantry from 1861. Just another quick note, I do want to mention that the White House base that is there on the Pamunkey River, uh, that is actually going to be a property that is in the Lee family. So it's sort of a, a similar situation to Arlington and the house that Robert E. Lee owned there. This is something that is in his family, and it's going to be owned by, I believe, one of his sons and during the time while McClellan's army is there, there's going to have to be a guard posted at the house because it is obviously in the possession of the man who's leading the army against you, right? Or who will be leading the army against you. I guess we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here. But there's going to be an effort to try to make sure there is no looting of that property this gives us a good idea of the mindset that McClellan is going to have. He doesn't want to rock the boat with any kind of civilians. He's going to try to prevent situations where there will be looting, foraging, destruction of property. And unfortunately, that property, he would include slaves into that as well, into that equation. So this is, it gives us a good idea of what his mindset is going to be while he is commanding the Army of the Potomac. Let's talk about what Robert E. Lee has been up to, though. I think it is often overlooked that before he commands the Army of Northern Virginia, he does a lot toward the gathering of resources for the defense of the city. And actually, that brings up a good point, because the name Army of Northern Virginia is not really used until Lee starts coining the name. It is born out of the wishful thinking that that is where the army would operate. Joseph Johnson would refer to his army as the Army of the Potomac, the old name, if you recall, from First Manassas. Most likely, this would be a dig at the Union counterpart of the same name. 
Jefferson Davis called it the Army of Richmond, so we have not yet solidified a name, but soon will. Lee, though, would be using his administrative role to call in reinforcements, especially from the coastal states of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Often, the state governments for these three were unwilling to part with the men as it left them exposed. Some of them were arriving on loan, as it were, set to be sent back once the crisis was averted. Through these dealings and this gathering of the additional resources, he is actually able to gather a sizable amount of men to at least pose a minor threat to McDowell at Fredericksburg. Sitting across the river at Fredericksburg from the 30,000 or so men that McDowell possessed would be some 10,000. So, not necessarily a tiny force, but certainly something that could cause him some trouble. Some of these reallocations were men from North Carolina under Lawrence O'Brien Branch. Branch was the politician turned general who commanded at New Bern, if you recall, losing to Ambrose Burnside's coastal invasion force. In May of 1862, Branch finds himself at Hanover Courthouse with a couple thousand men. Hanover Courthouse was important because it was north of the city. It was a key for communication and supply to any force that would be checking McDowell at Fredericksburg. In addition, it would potentially threaten the right flank. Porter would lead his three brigades north to Hanover Courthouse on May 27th. The 28th North Carolina would make contact with the lead elements of the Federals after reconnoitering Hanover Courthouse. The North Carolina Regiment is larger than their New York counterpart and would force them to retreat. Soon, though, a full brigade of Yankees under the command of Daniel Butterfield would follow up and force the 28th to withdraw. Now, Daniel Butterfield is an interesting figure, being a New York native who will be responsible partially for designing the core patches now famous from the Army of the Potomac. During this campaign, he will compose the iconic bugle call taps. Butterfield will serve in the east and follow our pal Joe Hooker out west before serving in various capacities for Grant during his presidency. With Butterfield's men doing the job of clearing the way, Porter is able to then capture the courthouse, sending out cavalry to probe for further enemy forces. Branch had moved his brigade-sized force a little further south on orders from Johnson, who was pulling in him as well as Joseph Anderson closer to the capital. John Martindale has two regiments of his brigade to meet Confederates under Branch. With only two regiments, he is actually outnumbered, although Branch will be under the misconception that he is facing a smaller force and not a whole division. Porter, oddly enough, is also under the false impression he is facing a much larger force, so he is keeping reinforcements initially away from Martindale, expecting the rebels to hit him somewhere else. The 18th North Carolina will assault Martindale's artillery, but are repulsed and flanked by a New York regiment. Despite this setback, the rebels eventually force Martindale back, but a fresh brigade arrives from McQuaid. Porter arrives on the field and pushes Branch back to Ashland. Casualties were 353 for the Union and 930 for the Confederates. Despite this being a little bit on the smaller side, McClellan would wire Washington that they had won a great victory. Johnson would recall Branch further into Richmond. Oddly enough, McClellan could have attacked with Porter's men to the south, 
and he may have been able to capture Richmond at this point. That is why this is considered to be the high watermark of McClellan's operations around Richmond, because this is going to be really his best opportunity to capitalize. Missing out on the opportunity, we're going to have the action at Seven Pines coming up shortly, and then the Seven Days. At that point, it's pretty much too late for McClellan. On May 17, 1862, we have further action in West Virginia. Remember, John C. Fremont has the command of the Mountain Department. Well, one of the goals of the Army as a whole was the elimination of the East Tennessee and Virginia Railroad, which was the lifeline between Virginia and the rest of the Confederacy. Railroads being scarce in the South made it that much more important, as we have already mentioned. Union troops under Jacob D. Cox would approach Mercer County, which is in the southern part of West Virginia, not too far from Blacksburg, which is where Virginia Tech is, in case you are all not aware. The goal would be to move on double in Virginia, which is where the railroad ran through. Jacob Cox is another interesting figure, being a politician from the Republican Party from Ohio. It was during his time as a senator that he would make the acquaintance of individuals like James Garfield, who served under him in 1862, as well as Salmon P. Chase. Cox will go on to command troops under Pope and in the Atlanta campaign, but would fall out of favor from the Republicans because he was not radical. He would amusingly serve in the Department of the Interior during Grant's presidency, but resign. Grant commenting that Cox thought he was the Department of the Interior. Later in life, Cox would write a history on the Second Manassas Campaign, but it is seen as an attempt to make sure Fitz John Porter did not receive the credit he deserved and keep him disgraced. It should be noted that of the civilian generals during the war, Jacob Cox is often in the list of those who serve particularly well. You remember that we talked about political generals and how sometimes they were not the best officers, but we can sort of chalk Cox into the good officer category for these political generals. In May of 1862, Cox would move his three brigades into Mercer County, capturing a key location at Princeton Courthouse. It would be here that the Confederates would meet him and actually drive him out of the town. We have a familiar face from the southern perspective in Marshall Humphrey. You remember the commander of the Army of Eastern Kentucky, who had a disastrous invasion of that state. Well, he is back and places his men on some high ground called Pigeon's Roost. Union forces would move on Pigeon's Roost and be ambushed by the waiting Confederates. Some 20 or so men from the 37th Ohio were killed, along with more wounded. Faced at the shock of the Confederate defense, Cox would withdraw, being reassigned as mentioned, and placed under Pope soon thereafter. For the time being, the Eastern Tennessee and Virginia Railroad was saved for the Confederacy. On May 20, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed into law the Homestead Act. Now what exactly is the Homestead Act, you say, and why is that being passed right now? Like, Isn't there a war going on, Abe? Like, shouldn't you have better things to do than, than pass these acts, right? Well, actually, this act was passed because there were some notable absences from the legislative branch, if you know what I mean. You might be surprised to know that the distribution of newly acquired land by the U.S. government has been an issue for some time. Should it be free to pretty much anyone, or should the government control it? Should landowners be able to purchase it? Those kinds of questions were all on the table. 
The Republican Party would run on tickets that included passing of homestead acts, which was part of their appeal to the common person, especially in northern states. So the opposition to this was pretty straightforward. Southern landholders and northern factory owners. Lack of slavery into the potential land that would be doled out led the South to be against the Homestead Act. Even those who benefited from a system of slavery, if you remember, were often hoping to one day emulate the plantations so they would also be opposed. Also, as you can imagine, if anyone could grab land, it might be a problem potentially for a larger scale cotton operation. Northern factory owners, on the other hand, were afraid that they would lose their factory workers if they knew that they could head out west. Now, in 1862, if you are missing delegates from the southern states, then that takes away a large part of the opposition to a Homestead Act. So, Lincoln decided to jump on that opportunity. Now, the act stipulated that a citizen who did not bear arms against the Union could be entitled to 160 acres of land. They would lay claim to that land and live for five years before receiving the deed. After the five years, they would have to show proof they lived on the land and made improvements. So this was a pretty good thing, right? Well, it was not without difficulties. 160 acres seems like a lot, but for more arid environments, it was not as conducive to crop production. There was still a lot of corruption as well. Most of the land would be claimed by miners, cattlemen, speculators, and the railroad. 500 million acres would be given out, with about 80 million being used by homesteaders. Still, on January 1, 1863, Daniel Freeman would file his claim, becoming the first individual to do so. This act is going to be beneficial for two large parties. Most notably, it would be beneficial to veterans, as well as the newly freed slave population, which this is part of the overall scheme, a necessary part prior to emancipation. So we can go ahead and stop right there. I know we had a bit of a shorter episode this week, but we did talk about the action at Hanover Courthouse today, which is considered at the time a great victory by McClellan. Actually, the events we will see next week will make his link up with McDowell a no-go, so stay tuned. We also had the skirmish at Princeton Courthouse and the Homestead Act from Abraham Lincoln and why that is important. Next week, we will spend our time exclusively in the Shenandoah Valley and see Stonewall Jackson put the fear of God into Washington. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.